Uh, we've now heard really quite an extraordinary representation uh, on this aging population, the demographic issue. Uh, we heard about it from a financial point of view, uh, financial security, uh, how we move into that phase in life. We heard about it from a work point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, John, you opened up where you challenged the very word crisis. I mean, this is not new. This is something we've known about, and yet, where is it on the public agenda? Uh, and where do we try to get to a place where, uh, in the Foreign Policy Association, uh, the World Leadership Council, we've had uh, speakers and discussions the last day or so, or the next couple of days, on the environment, on major issues of fiscal and economic policy. Uh, this aging phenomenon is something that's been with us. We've known about it. Uh, and yet it's not on the public agenda. So I just find that very interesting and something that perhaps it is great that the FPA is doing that. Uh, so uh, let's just get some, go ahead, uh, sir. Thank you. Ed Cox, um, picking up where you left off, sir, you, you began by talking about the need to restructure some of the social programs. And you say this, this has been coming for a long time, but somehow it's not on the agenda. And so I'm trying to reconcile that with what we just heard, because it seems to me that if more of the population is becoming older, there is going to be less political impetus for this to be on the agenda in terms of real entitlement reform. And so I'm wondering if I can get your reaction to that. Uh, well, I disagree. I think that uh, we've just had a major effort to reform our health care system, uh, pushing it in a direction of being more responsive to an older population as well as covering younger people. Uh, I think that all of the remarks today were about opening up possibilities for older workers and uh, maybe taking down some of the barriers that currently exist there. Um, we. Uh, we do face fiscal challenges, and I think every country will. But um, if we are smart about this, uh, we will focus on keeping people productive, keeping ev economic growth robust, and that'll make the fiscal challenge a, a little easier to deal with. Andy, did you? No, I think I, I would. I would echo much of what John said. I think we all. Um, you know, we could have a separate session around why the political system is so poor at uh, grappling with this particular set of issues, um, which, you know, have coalition aspects which can be difficult, are out in the future, are not necessarily tangible and sort of here and now. Um, I do think, you know, without restating John's point, that, you know, when you take uh, some of the things that were just discussed, I think there are some um, some opportunities to relieve some pressures uh, around entitlement reform uh, because of a, uh, a willingness to reconsider work patterns that has not been fully in, in the policy debate in Washington. The Finance Committee um, did a hearing several months ago on the Senate side around unretirement uh, and what would be the implications of, uh, of unretirement on the Social Security system, which I I think it was a good beginning of a conversation around you know that topic and how it intersects with entitlement reform, um, but you know sort of a, a drop in the bucket in terms of the extent to which uh, you know some of these themes need to meet the traditional actuarial calculations around the program. In my view, Thank you. Jeff, did you want to comment? Okay, well, just uh, you know, um, excellent question. It is the set of issues under the aging topic are regarded as a third rail. Uh, you know, President Sarkozy attempts to raise the retirement age by two years, and everyone takes to the streets. But he will get it done. From 60 to 62. Right. 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 <laughs> um, and we haven't even covered some of the health issues. There was just a report that came out yesterday, uh, Alzheimer's, which fortunately will explode as longevity continues. I think it's one in two people after 85 will have it. Uh, the numbers today, this new report just came out yesterday, indicate that it's 1% of global, global GDP, $604 billion, And it's exploded. So the issue is, how do we look at these items 
and do something about them today, invest in it today to make the changes so we can move through the future. Uh, yes. Uh, Cadet Pamela Baker, United States Military Academy. This isn't necessarily concerning that, sir. My question is concerning specifically people who have the economic ability to retire um, and whether or not them staying in the workforce could have an adverse effect on our growing problem within the country of unemployment rates and uh, in the fact that we're reducing the amount of job openings that are present, especially if we move toward this corporate lattice idea. Jeff, did you want to take it? So... Um, one of the one of the um, I spend most of my time looking at workforce and talent issues in organizations, and there's this very interesting disconnect is not a good way to put it, but there there is a disconnect between the unemployment challenge and the skilled talent challenge, right? Um, and and I would summarize it. I, I I'm sort of writing something that we're working on, and we're calling it a sort of a tale of two charts. Okay, one chart is Imagine that you looked at the unemployment data for the last 10 years, and you looked at it, in, looked at the unemployment for people who have a bachelor's degree or more. It's never been more than 5%. It averages about 2.5%. Even during the height of the recession, it was in the about a 4.5%. People with some college, about 8 or 9 or 10%. People with high school, about 12 or 14%. People with, without a, a completed high school, about 18 to 20%. Okay incredibly consistent over the last 20, 30 years. So the skill shortage that companies are facing and organizations facing is for an increasingly educated workforce. So keeping educated people, again, so the question is, which people are we trying to keep in the workforce becomes the question, okay? Here's the other chart. From 19, in 1995, the United States, and I apologize for taking a United States view, but if you look at the percentage of people who graduated from, who are college graduates with tertiary degrees, four-year degrees, the U.S. was number one in the world in 1995. We're now number 14, mm -hmm. right? So the, the race in terms of skill and workforces is about people with increasing amounts of education, right? And, and it's even affecting what has traditionally been called blue-collar work. Right? And the example I'll give, and this is one that we hear about a lot, not just in the U.S., but globally, is there's huge interest in green-collar jobs and environmental jobs. The challenge with environmental jobs is they require people that have combinations often of technical skills, manufacturing skills, but also very high-end skills. Think about welders who can read complicated blueprints, right? which is the skill set you need to produce a wind turbine. Right, And so we, we have this new requirement in the economy, which is for, I don't know what you'd call it, people who have blue shirts with white collars, <laughs> right? right? I mean, it's, it's this real hybrid, right? But regardless of what you do in America or in any country in the world, right, the, the focus on increasing education and the shortage will continue to be for people who have those skill sets. Thanks, so, again, Jeff. that's just part of that. I could just be real quick. I don't think there's an economist today who would say having more people continuing working would mean fewer jobs for younger people. It doesn't work like that. It expands the total economy, drives consumer demand, and creates jobs, not shifts jobs. Uh, and you know, maybe just one last sentence on it. And in, to that regard, to John's point, it reminds me a lot of uh, immigration as a, as a topic of right. discussion in that um, you know, there's going to be a, there will be a, uh, in my view, a cadre that will try to drive some fear around older workers returning to the workplace, preventing opportunities among younger workers. But I think the economic evidence just w will not bear it out. But, you know, in the, in the policy debate, uh, that's going to need to be a point of view that's put forth in a, in a strong way. Um, Great. Uh, John, would you? John Don Van, your uh, MC for today. Th this, this conversation sort of, brings to mind for me Prince Charles' dilemma of waiting all of his life for his mother to get out of the way. So <laughs> and now you're saying she can actually keep going and yeah. go on a lattice and he can keep, keep being going. a prince and not a king. You, you actually just answered part of my question, which is whether there would be opportunities. But I also want to look at kind of the public relations part of it, because you know, there's the whole issue of seniority 
in a, in a company. And as, as a young person, I really just did want the old folks to retire, and fortunately, ultimately, they did. Mm -hmm. Now that I understand that experience is really an important thing, I like this idea of staying for, <laughs> for a long time. But, it, but in fact, there are younger people who want the positions, they want the seniority, they want what comes yeah. with that. Seniority has always been correlated with age. Does that change? In the um, system you're talking let, about. let me um, open by not answering you. Uh, John, uh, John Beard, uh, just about 18 months ago, was appointed uh, director of, at the World Health Organization of Aging and Life Course. Now, we very consciously, and they very consciously, chose the word life course. And it's been alluded to already. Aging is in some ways about older people, but it's really about a whole new process of how we live our lives. And so the demographic shifts require a whole new approach to the sociology and culture of, of it. Uh, and not necessarily just about what are we going to do about someone who's 92. Um, and, just you know, quick, quick answer because there's a number of questions that I don't want to go on too long. But I, I mean, one way to think about it, um, and I think that the, the, the potential for resentment and, and bad feeling that you highlighted is real. But I think we're going to look back at the, the, you know, what the lattice produces and the return of, of older workers to the workforce. This will look a lot like it, it will have as transformative an impact in workplaces as women entering the workforce uh, in a significant way in the 1960s. And mm -hmm. so I think to a certain extent, we need to think about what this conversation would have felt like there. And the, you know, I don't like working with women. I resent that a woman is going to take my job. And we're, you know, in most workplaces, we are so far beyond that. Uh, I think we, we're going to need to figure out how we as a society can kind of race down that learning curve a heck of a lot faster than what it's, uh, it's taken in terms of women in the workforce. But I, I think it's, uh, if you look at it through that prism, I think that's the degree of social shift that we're talking about. And, um, and it, you know, there will be challenges as well as, you know, opportunities to accelerate. Uh, I, I, okay, I, just I, we have five minutes left. Oh, so sorry. each of you make a comment, and then we'll go to one more question, okay. and then we're done. Uh, Jeff. So very briefly, I, I, I think... Um, I think that resentment in that sense of frustration is real. Um, I think one of the uh, one trend that will help us with that is um, work has changed in a lot of ways over the last 20 or 30, 40 years. One way it's changed is the percentage of work that's done in almost every industry that's project based versus being based in a bureaucracy is much, much higher. By one measure, you know, 30, 40 times growth over the last 20 or 30 years of work is project-based. So what we're beginning to see is there are, A, a lot of opportunities for us to help move um, younger people into positions of authority and leadership, but also to keep people engaged who have experience because so much of the work that we do is based on projects and based on teams and not based on those hierarchical structures. We're just figuring that out in large organizations. I, I just want to say something to the uh, cadets in the room because, you know, obviously you live in a hierarchical structure, maybe the last one to change uh, in, along these lines. But you should really be thinking about um, developing skills that would be useful to you outside the military when you are ready to leave because um, you will need uh, to have a second career or a third career. And so uh, that's probably true for all of us. Uh, we shouldn't get so identified with the one thing we're doing now and assume that that goes on indefinitely. We need, we need more flexibility in our own personal uh, ideas about our future as well as the lattice and corporations. I think we have time for one more question. Um, very, very quickly, I think one thing that has not been addressed here is that a redefinition of the word, what is a dependent? And legally, a dependent is a minor child or a spouse. But today, with the baby boomers um, taking care of parents, you have a huge 50% divorce rate. So you could have a sibling taking care of another sibling who is over a certain age. I think that this has to be readdressed because by giving a tax deduction for a redef redefined dependent, puts money back into the consumer's hands to refuel the economy. If we have a deficit, savings, people don't have savings because 
they're spending everything, and it goes back to what we talked about this morning. So, you know, John at AARP, could you lobby to redefine dependent? <laughs> Oh, well, I think what you're talking about is not redefining, but uh, uh, finally getting the tax code to recognize the fact that uh, it's a much bigger phenomenon. And um, it is. I mean, and it's going to grow. And um, uh, so I think you make a good point. I, I, I agree. Well, I guess one more question. Um, I was going to say that I think that the aging year that people tend to look up and they tend to look down. But they don't look at the reproductive years. And interestingly, um, I think women, of course, uh, have children during certain years, but men want to be parents during certain years. And we all know the stories of men who missed raising their children because they were at the early stages of their career. And it's an, an interesting um, uh, opportunity for the groups who are particularly interested in re uh, second careers. To, to join with people or career, the, the, the population age that would like to spend some years being a parent. And that, by definition, has to be a Thank you. So, uh, in, uh, I would say, at least 10 years ago, uh, Kofi Annan said, Quote, the challenge before us now is to place global aging firmly on the develop ag development agenda for this century. There is no time to lose. This conversation made it clear that it needs to be on the developed country agenda as well. It's certainly a common topic. The data and the reality is here. And so again, I think on behalf of the panelists, we're delighted that the FPA and the World Leadership Council saw fit to put this topic on its agenda this year. And thank you all for your contributions and your attention.